Boys, this week, the name of the marquee is not attached to any particular fight. Because this week, the name of the marquee is Francis Ngannou. And the headline that Francis Ngannou and the UFC have indeed parted ways. Mark, let me start with you this time. Uh, what is your reaction to the news of Ngannou and the UFC saying, uh, it's been fun, thanks, and we're going we're gonna to cruise in opposite directions? Yeah, uh, what a headline it is. It is not every day that your heavyweight champion walks away from the promotion, especially when you are willing to make him the highest paid heavyweight ever, more than Brock Lesnar, according to what Dana has told us, which I'm inclined to believe. Um, not a great headline for the UFC, which adds to a, what has been a rough 2023 thus far. I know Dana has already begun. He's in full spin mode trying to spin it. He's going to continue to try to make you think that Francis Ngannou is not the best heavyweight in the world, even though he certainly is at this point in time. He is going to try to make you think that he's scared to fight other people, even though he fought Cyril Ghan on one leg. And one. Um, and, and one. one. Uh, and fought the guy people call the GOAT heavyweight twice in Steve Miocic and whoever the fuck else you want to add into this list of names that he has fought. Um, said in these negotiations that he was willing to fight Bones and whoever else it would have been. Um, and I guess we'll get into all this as we kind of throw it back and forth here. But yeah, it is it is an interesting choice by Ngannou. Um Obviously, he had a lot of asks. He has a lot of beliefs in the power that he believes the fighters should have. The UFC, especially now, I think it's safe to say we are not going to see them caving on these kind of things anytime soon. If they could not cave to their heavyweight champion, I don't think they're going to be caving in general on things like sponsorships and whatever else could be on the table. And Francis stuck to his guns and said, you know what, if... if you're not going to get me what I've been kind of fighting for here, then I'm going to walk. And we'll see as time goes on if that was the right decision or not. It could certainly go either way in that scenario, which I guess we can get into as we sort of run through this here. But it's going to be interesting to see uh, to see where he goes next, that's for sure. Omar, when the news broke, what were your reactions to Francis, who is the current rightful UFC heavyweight champion, just vacating his title. I've, I've heard, I saw some headlines saying that he was stripped, and then I saw sort of reactive headlines saying it is incorrect to say that he was stripped. He vacated the belt because he said thanks but no thanks to this next contract. Yeah, like Mark said, they're in full pinwheel mode, and they have been fucking turning <laughs> since all of this went down. And let's not – let's keep in mind from what I understood from what Francis was talking about with his interview with Ariel – his contract expired in the middle of December. He's known about this for quite some time. Um, they were still in talks, however, so he kind of was still trying to have, you know, some, somewhat professionalism as far as how that was handled. Didn't go online and was like, you know, fuck the UFC, I'm out, peace out. Um, he was still trying to figure some things out. Um, once they got to this point, T-Mobile is really... whoever. <laughs> Whoever leaked that T-Mobile thing is basically oh, the new the new Ariel Hawani yes, because yes, yes. that whoever screwed that up is I guarantee you is probably not only fired but somewhat blackballed in that industry because oh, I, I, they I screwed up. So they the, originally the the whole reason why this even happened, why we even really found out about this is because somebody who works at T-Mobile Arena, I'm assuming, we actually oh, don't know oh, the details. The arena. I it's got to be multiple somebody. somebodies who started. It's not just like one guy threw that up on a building. This was a group of somebodies. Well, who somebody that flipped the fucking switch that made yeah, it go yeah. outside. Right, so whoever right. that dickhead was is yeah. gone. Yeah. Whatever intern or whatever that was, out, outski. Done. So just, just to clarify for people who may not know, they put a promotional poster for Bones versus Gone up on the T-Mobile Arena. And it said on it for the vacant World Heavyweight Championship. And everyone saw Whoops. it and said, wait, wait <laughs> what, what could this mean? What do you mean vacant? Did something happen with Francis? And then the UFC released everything all at once oh, that Francis was yeah. gone and that Bones was back and he was fighting gone now and so on and so on. Yes, obviously it's not one the of, way they wanted to break that news. One of the few times that as a collective we all did math properly in, <laughs> in seeing all that news and deducing all that. Yeah, right. Um, 
So we did find out Dana White came out in a in a one of the I, I think it was before the Strickland fight actually happened uh, at one of the little pressers that they have. Yeah. Um, and they kind of discussed it, and, and he was like, "Yeah, you know, they screwed up." But this is happening. This is legit. Um, Francis is has been released, is what he said, uh, and said a lot of like. To be honest, Ariel's podcast, his interview, or first his podcast, breaking down, and breaking down the new breakdown where he has receipts and he goes through these interviews minute by minute and just shits on everything that they say is quite fantastic. We don't have the time to do those types of breakdowns because it's literally like an hour and a half. But I recommend it for full details. <laughs> um, but uh, Dana White tried to spin a lot of shit and used a lot of language that was very purposeful to try to get you to believe that somehow Francis is the dick in all this. Um, Francis sounds like he, he asked for a lot of things. He was also very clear about the fact that he didn't expect to get all of those things. But you work your way at the top and then you kind of chisel your way back down. When it comes to negotiations, right? You don't start with the number that you generally will accept. You start at the number that, you know, something high and then you work your way down. Um, so there were a lot of things. I think one of, you know, he talked about health insurance, even though he doesn't need health insurance. Like he's good now. Uh, but he talks about the guys at the bottom and, and you know, what about them? Um, he was talking about being able to be free. And I think the freedom thing was the one that, that really stuck and continued to resonate throughout the interview. Uh, and the reality is, is, you know, the UFC has used a lot of legal jujitsu to ensure these guys are marked as independent contractors and not employees, but they treat them and are basically stuck in this company as employees because as independent contractors, they are still while under contract with the UFC, not allowed to basically do jack shit without the UFC giving their say. So most of the time in this case, it's, a jiu-jitsu match here or some kind of grappling match there. Uh, but for example, if Nganu wanted to go fight Tyson Fury or if GSP wanted to fight Oscar De La Hoya, as that was a thing at some point, it's not going to happen. Um, they tried to get gangster with Nganu. They were like, you know, Nganu right now trains out of Couture, uh, Extreme Couture. Apparently they got gangster with him and was like, you, you know, this isn't how this works. You can go ask Couture how that worked out for him. And he went and asked Gator. He said, "How did this work out for you?" And Gator was like, "Didn't happen great. This is what it was." Um, and I think Francis has just gotten to a point where you know it is more. It seemed like it was more than the money because at the end of the day, the UFC was only offering money. There were no other concessions that were even on the table for them. It sounds like, uh, which is probably why the Brock Lesnar thing is true. I think they probably tried to give him and throw all the money they possibly could at him, but Francis and Gandhi was looking for more than just money uh, and the freedom to do what he wanted, whether it was to box, whether it was to move on, whether it was to whatever is what he wanted, I think above all else. Uh, and the UFC was never going to, to do that. They were, I don't think they were ever under Dana White's rule. I don't think that's a precedent they're ever going to set. Um, so it was an interesting listen, you know, to hear uh, Francis do something like that. Um, Dana White's spin about him wanting to leave and fight lesser opponents had oh. me double do a double take because I was like, I'm pretty sure the whole plan is to go fight Tyson Fury. So is that a dig at Tyson Fury? Because that's crazy. That's wild. He was talking about the PFL when he yeah. made that comment. Yeah, sure. It's but. it's a he he's a wild wild man. There is a point to be made that the heavyweight divisions across the board in other organizations are not the strongest. Bellator oh, arguably sure. might have the the best heavyweight division right now. And it uh, pales in terms the of. UFCs. Right. I mean, it, it, it is kind of the leftovers of the other organizations at this point that are that are making up the heavyweight division of Bellator um, and kind of new guys that we really don't know in, in one and in PFL um, who haven't really made the splash to the mainstream. Um, yeah. But I mean, if this guy is making 35, 40 million for a Tyson Fury fight. Oh. I mean, yeah. I, th I think this was very much about Fury. I think he has had a lot of talks. Oh, yeah. Obviously, we've seen him in the ring with Fury after Fury's last win, or was that two wins ago, whenever he was in the ring with him. Whether it's going to be a boxing match or some type of mixed rules agreement or whatever, I think there's a lot of wheels in motion. I think the UFC was saying this is not something that can happen. And whether it's the right decision or the wrong decision, 
long term, we don't know. But I respect if Francis just felt like, you know what, as a man, I want to fight Tyson Fury, and I don't like being told that I can't do that. And, you know, like, you work for an employer, that's the way it is sometimes. So if, if that's what he had to do to get out and feel like he was able to control his own destiny, then good on him. He, he's a guy who's very comfortable in his own skin. He knows exactly who he is. He's never really worried about what is being said about him, what people think about him. Obviously, the guy has been through a ton in his life, if you know his backstory, to get to where he is right now. And I think he's just a guy who is comfortable being like, you know what? I'm not. He doesn't even have a manager right now, which we can also I, touch on. I he was did all say this that, yeah. kind of by himself with some advice here and there. But I think he was kind of like, you know what? Even if this is the wrong choice in the end, I will be happy to be able to control my own destiny right now and do what I want to do. And wow. if that's what this boils down to, then I, I, you can't hate on it. I'll tell you this. Whatever time Nganu has spent not fighting, he's been learning English because his interview skills are <laughs> fucking A+, plus, my man. I don't ever think he was ever this clear or articulate in the past. And I'm glad he's gotten there now because with a situation like this, to be able to defend yourself without any kind of interpreter or without any kind of confusion, to like really be able to, to articulate your point for something like this, something that is quite unprecedented if we really think about it, right? Like there have been other guys who have left in the past, but it hasn't been, I feel like this, I get, maybe Randy Couture is the last one that I remember being this contentious. Um, but, you know, th this is definitely not the first time we've had Dana White try to spin a lot of garbage when it comes oh, to this kind of stuff. there's been plenty of guys who are scared to fight. Yeah. I mean, they're, <laughs> we're, we're, well, we're talking about more the, uh, the, the you know, if you don't want to be here, you don't have to be here. That's probably true for the guy who's 1-0 and in the UFC, you know what I mean, who may talk a little bit of shit or something like that. Like, you don't want to be here. Sure, you can leave. <clears throat> when it comes to people who have a name, like, ask Rockhold if he wanted to leave. Could he leave? Because I doubt it. GSP couldn't leave when he was already retired and he wanted to fight Oscar De La Hoya. They yep. said no. Yep. That's not true. It's, it's it's a load of bullshit. You know what I mean? Uh, Ngannou's contract had a timer on it. The timer elapsed. The stuff that they, the stuff that Ngannou wants that possibly the boxing contracts will be able to provide to him to some extent, the UFC is not going to match. So this whole idea of, yeah, we were, you know, we... We, we, you know, you don't want to be here. You don't have to be here. We're not going to try to mash it or anything. We you know you're good. You know, if you don't want to be here, go away. He, they didn't have the option. They weren't going to match whatever the contract was. So it's not, it's not, it's, it's almost like when you're already on your way to your room and your mom goes, yeah, that's right. You go to your room. It's, I was already, I'm going, it, it's yeah. already happening. I, I was under the impression they waived the option to match that they did. No, they that's did have it. But the point, the reason why they waived it is because they knew what Nganu was going to get offered. They were never oh, going I'm to match sorry. it. I got you. Well, yeah. Think. But, but they're, the way they're making it sound is that they did it because it's out of the, out of the niceness or, you know, out of, out of this like right, morality see. of, you know, of course we don't keep fighters here. We don't, we don't hold people hostage when there's literally, literal people hostage right now in their contracts in the UFC. Mike, let, let's get you in here. Yeah. It makes me think of a few things of, of just, um, well, first, it makes me think of somebody like a Corey Anderson, because at first I'm like, really, he's, you know, he's the heavyweight champ of the UFC, but he just wants to walk away. And, you know, Dana put out there that he would have been the highest paid heavyweight ever. Um, but then I think of Corey Anderson of like how Corey Anderson, you know, up to the point of like sharing his actual numbers, um, he has been very candid and open about saying this is the most money he's ever been paid by Bellator. Um, and on the other side, I think about somebody like Connor, who, you know, Connor could have at some point gone through this whole stink and been like, I'm only getting paid a couple million dollars to fight Nate Diaz, where I could go make 40 million fighting a boxer. And he could have done this, although the UFC kind of made an exception for him now, didn't they? Oh, they did. But, but yeah. Connor has always been an exception. Connor is yes. a walking exception. But just the whole idea, I remember Dana saying this just recently with the, the, some of the Patty Pimlet controversy of saying about fighter pay, about saying as just being on the UFC roster gives you so much more notoriety uh, and, and, and just, uh, what's the word I'm trying to say, like public oh, for sure. perception that you have other, you will have other money-making opportunities out there. And, and then like 
linking it back to Connor. Like Connor made a few million for his fights each, you know, at the high levels. But then he starts his whiskey company and he's, he sold that for like however many tens of millions of dollars. So you look at a guy yeah. like, you know, you go back to, you know, the, the Corey Anderson's who's like, I'm getting paid so much more to fight at Bellator. And then you look at a guy like Nganu and you're like, could Nganu have so many more business opportunities had he stayed as the UFC heavyweight champion for some years? I don't know. And then it also raises the question. This will be my last thing. It does raise the question of why is the UFC so apparently so stingy? So damn, they're the fucking UFC. And how are companies like the PFL and Bellator outbidding them? If if Bellator and PFL are coming up with these hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars. I saw a, a meme comparing the fighter pay between Chad Mendez's first fight at bare knuckle being comparable to that of Francis's title defense. Yeah. yeah. How could that be? I don't know. I mean, they had Francis still locked on a good contract from earlier, I believe. So okay. I don't know what this contract would have been. For all we know, it would have been very good, and it could have been as much as he'd be making in Bellator or PFL where, or wherever else he would go. I really don't think this was about money. I think it's about fury. But on top of it, boxing pays a shit ton. And, yeah, it's only one fight, which kind of and, – and you've kind of segued me into the next point I wanted to make here, which is that, yes – he can now be free. He can go do whatever he wants to do with Tyson Fury. He can get paid out the ass for whatever that's going to be. He is going to lose unless yes. it's really some major, you know, like kicking is allowed or, or takedowns are allowed, but I can't imagine that's ever happening. So whatever it is, he's going to lose. And then what happens? So th like, that's my one concern here. And again, if all he's thinking about is I want to be in charge of my own life and I don't being I don't like being told I can't fight Tyson Fury, which is obviously, you know, it's going to be the biggest thing he's ever done in his life is, is fight Tyson Fury. Then good on him. Sure. And take it from there. But I do worry about what happens after he loses to Tyson Fury, because a now people have seen him lose a fight, which always hurts a little bit, even if it's a fight where. You know, take like take Connor. They knew he was going to lose. It's still when you see him lose, he loses a little bit of his like aura, and that will happen to Nganu. Does the UFC say like, "Hey, you did your thing now, welcome back"? I don't think that's happening. So, what does he then do? Because as you said, yeah, he can go make money. The PFL will give him money. The Bell Bellator will give him money. He doesn't matter in these places, an iota of how much he matters in the UFC. And he had plenty of career left. I'm not saying he's, you know, he doesn't have a decade left. He's not some super young guy. But he had plenty of fights left. It's not, it's not like he had one or two more and he was out of here. He's got fights left in the tank. So he possibly, again, we don't know how this is going to go. But he possibly has said, I'm going to kind of give away the late end of my career as a star here for this Fury fight. And then I don't really know what I have after that. Again, he'll get paid, but it's just not going to be with a spotlight on him that is a, the kind of spotlight he deserves as the best heavyweight on the planet. I would put it like in terms of this, though, right? Let's say, for, let's say he does make... What, what did they make in the last... That last heavyweight fight, the, the Fury-Wilder fight? I mean, they were making at least a few tens of millions of dollars, right? I could look it up. Because if it's anything that's comparable to that, even on the B side of things, right? Tyson Fury is definitely going to be the A side there. There's no, there's no doubt to that. What was it? 30, 20? 30 and 20 million. So let's say it's 20 million, right? They were talking about Nganu getting like Brock Lesnar's 200. Ariel said Brock Lesnar's 200 appearance was 8 million. And I believe Nganu said the, the new contract would have been something like that for John Jones. So let's say it's, it's, maybe eight, nine, ten million. He could make double that in one fight. You know what I mean? He doesn't have to fight twice. He doesn't have to worry about his knee in that case. Yeah. I agree. I'm not talking about the money though. Yep. I'm talking about who Francis Ngannou is going forward once that Tyson Fury fight is over. He he instead of being the heavyweight champion of the world in the UFC or at least in the mix and other huge fights he kind of becomes uh, a guy on an island doing I don't know what. Yeah. 
Well, Godspeed, Francis, and whatever you do. Man, Fury's going to make him look bad. Yeah. Yeah. And who knows, maybe some stud starts coming up through the ranks in PFL or Bellator and Ganu ends up there and, and a big fight happens. Like, you, you never know how this shit plays, or one or who knows what. You never know how this shit plays out. Maybe there is some avenue where he still is in a big fight, but, you know, hard hard to see that at at this moment. You know, I you know other than a boxing uh, exhibition, I can see him sort of being a sort of journeyman for the rest of his career, but like a very high level one. Yeah, maybe, I agree. Like I could see him fighting under almost every other banner. Like maybe he fights. Oh my god, Fedor. Maybe he fights Bader. Maybe and then he goes to PFL and he fights fucking Kayla Harrison for into like a fucking crazy. Thing. I don't know. And then he fights some mixed rules fight against like and an older won. boxer, like random. Yeah, Under, I could, yeah. So, that's what I'm saying. That's what I don't want his career to be because we're not there yet. He's not at the end. Yeah, I really want him so to fucking fight John Jones. There's two. There's two points there that were fantastic. The first one is that in Ganu Fedor fight sounds like it could happen at this point now. Totally that's, possible. That's just, Let's go. Yeah. That's literally Let's just fucking death. go. Fedor's right fighting there. his last fight right now, dude. He's over. <laughs> he could come back. He can come back. Especially if he loses to Bader. That's and certainly the end. And Ganu is the biggest test of his career. He's got to <laughs> come back. Um, oh, God. I forgot what the second one was. That one was too good. Mark, Fedor's like one of your guys, right? I love Fedor. Is he yeah, on right. your, like, he's on your like Mount Rushmore. That's his last emperor right in there. In terms of my favorite fighters ever or in yeah, terms yeah, of yeah. who I think are the best fighters ever? Oh, I don't know. You tell me. I I wouldn't say. I mean, I love Fedor, but he. I wouldn't say if I had to rattle off like my three, four favorite fighters ever, he wouldn't be on that list. Oh, oh, okay. But if I was naming my three, four goats ever, sure. I think he would be on the list. He's way up there. Okay.